We are his portion and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all seeking. So heaven meets earth like a passionate kiss. And my heart turns violently inside of my chest. And I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Did you know that? We're not alone in this room. I believe that there are angels all around us. And if we will praise our God, we're joining them as they praise their God, our God too. So please join us as we sing this song. In your presence, we're surrounded by your grace. By your promise, you are present in our praise. Jesus, you're near. Jesus, you're here with us. Spirit.
circling around your throne worshiping you and so we say Jesus Lord Emmanuel Messiah King of Kings and Lord of Lords our King and our Lord this moment is yours Jesus Amen Amen Good stuff. You may be seated. Welcome. Yes, it is December the 4th, our first Sunday in a new month in December. All good. How are you guys doing this morning? Excited to be here. If you have your Bibles as we continue in worship, but we will have some announcements at the end, some housekeeping and some things, but let's lean in right now to what the Lord has for us. By the way, you look great. I'm glad you're here. Camp lunch today. So, by the way, if you do smell meatloaf, just try to put that out of your focus. You guys on camera from your living rooms, you will not smell the meatloaf, but maybe you smell something else. But whatever it is, just we got to lean in as we wrap up uh, our time in this uh, mini-series called Pathways. So once again, great to be with you. If you have your Bibles, Philippians is where we'll be in your New Testament, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, as you are turning there, this is the final edition of Pathways. And so we'll go in some different directions today as we wrap up this series. But we've been looking at what it means to be a spiritually healthy church. We have a tendency, as we've talked about, to think about spiritual healthiness based on what we see on the outside. Even maybe visiting a new church, you probably are looking at the buildings, the size of the buildings, the size of the crowds. Maybe you're interested in the budget, how healthy is the budget Budgets aren't bad things, but is that really the measure of health? I say that, and at the end of this service, we're going to confirm the budget for next year, <laughs> for 2023. But, but again, is that how you evaluate health? Do you evaluate it based on the programs, you know? Kids, students, all the different programs. Uh, it's where Jesus was on a pathway, literally, and he sees this fig tree from a distance, and it had all this green foliage and leaves, and it looked like it would produce fruit. It was not fig season, but it looked healthy and fruitful on the outside. So as he, he goes up to it, 
But because of the foliage, he says, you know what? You appear to be fruitful, but up close you're really not. It wasn't the fig tree's fault. It wasn't fig season. But Jesus captures that moment as an illustration to say, you know what? I know Israel, and Israel in his day, his very own people, they looked good on the outside. They seemed to have it all together. They were very good at religion. But up close, Jesus says, I know your hearts, and you're not fruitful. You're not really healthy on the inside. Throughout this series, that's challenged us to think about what personal maturity and spiritual health really looks like. And, and even if you're not there yet, at, le at least you can see the target. At least you can see the goal, that it's not just church for the sake of church, that, that it means something, that God's at work here, and he's, he's at work in your living rooms, and that relationship with him is going somewhere that's important for each one of us. And so we began thinking about, okay, what are some pathways that lead us to be more like him? That's the measure of healthiness is we need to be like the one who created us, the one who made church possible, who, who died and rose again to make church possible. Let's be more like him. So what are the pathways that get us there? So we began talking about, it's good to have programs, but what if every one of our programs drove that mission of leading you to be more like Jesus? I don't care what it is. But don't just have programs for the sake of programs. Have programs that lead you to be more like him. We talked about being a church that's under the authority of the word of God. That's a wonderful thing. But be careful. We want to approach the word not just for information. That many times we just show up and we check mark a box and we've received new information, very good information. This is the inspired Word of God. But how many of us seek the Word, approach the Word, spend time in the Word for transformation, not just information? That it's leading you in the power of the Spirit and God to be more like Jesus. We talked about this, that church attendance is a good thing, but we should never be satisfied with it. Healthy church attendance isn't the measure of health. It's the beginning point of a deeper relationship. What if our culture and our expectation here was that we want to lead you to get smaller in how you relate to other believers, small groups, life groups, classes, mentorships, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever it takes to lead you and move the needle of your spiritual health. Even if you're a teacher, that you have that place where you're being fed so that church membership is never to be satisfied. That's not satisfying. That's just the beginning of a possible deeper relationship that we're driving towards teaching ultimately in a way that we are equipping. This is where we landed last week. Being an equipping center so that every member becomes a minister. That's really the goal. And, and that sounds lofty, but think about it this way. If we're becoming more like Jesus, won't we be doing the things he did? Won't we be inevitably more like him in such a way that we become his hands and feet? So that every member becomes a minister. That we champion that goal. That we long for it. And that we want to lean into it and say, God, I really want to be part of that. And that drives us forward to be the church, the healthy church that God wants us to be. Now, some of what, I, what I'm going to say today is a little bit sad about the condition of the overall church these days. But I'm going to ask you this. If we're committed to being that spiritually healthy church, what are the commitments that will have us standing apart, that will make us unique, set us apart from other churches? We're not in competition. But the state of the church today, I'm telling you this, that a healthy church will stand apart. Did you hear me on that? A healthy church will stand apart. And we're going to look and see some of that, even beginning in the century of the first church with Paul the Apostle. He was a church planter, a missionary. That's what he did as a ministry. Now, he didn't get paid for that. He was a tent maker. He had a platform from which he went around planting churches, growing and reaching and sharing the gospel. He was a disciple who made disciples, who then gathered his churches. We have in his word now, if you're in Philippians, this is one of the churches that he helped to begin in the first century. And I want you to see what he says about this church. They stood apart. 
from all the other churches in the Roman Empire, however many, hundreds, thousands, I don't know. But let's say the Roman Empire was the Bible belt of their day, and they stood apart. A healthy church will stand apart. What does that look like? What are the commitments? Let's read. If you have, if you found uh, verse 14, you can stand if you want. You can if you'd like to. That'd be good in honor of reading God's Word. We don't do that all the time down here, but you can if you'd like to in honor of reading God's Word. I'll, I'll do that too. It's like, why is a preacher sitting when everybody else has to stand up? There you go. Hey, you stand too. Get off that couch, all right? Put the recliner down and get up for the reading of God's Word. Here's what Paul says to them beginning in verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Paul's ministries had a lot of challenges, a lot of persecution. He says, you shared in my trouble. And you Philippians, you believers there in Philippi, you yourselves know that in the beginning of all this, as Paul was beginning his ministries, the beginning of that gospel ministry, he says, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, where persecution was really heavy, he says this, even there, you sent me help for my needs over and over again. That's what he's saying there, once and again, once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit. Like what motivated the gift? What was behind it? The fruit that increases as they grow in their walk, as they were growing ultimately to their credit, to their glory. I have received full payment, he says, and much more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus. That was one of their young church members that they had raised up to send out. He was helping Paul. He was the courier. He was the go-between. He carried the gifts. He says, I've received, Paul says, I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God, he says, will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory, not just now, but forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, first of all, bless the reading of your word. And as we continue in worship, what are those commitments? What, what made this church, however big, however small, we don't know, it could have been just a handful of believers gathering in someone's house. It wasn't about the building. It wasn't about the size. It wasn't about the programs. But, but there was something that even Paul would say, you only partnered with me, invested with me in the ministry that Paul had in advancing the gospel and planting churches and being a disciple who would make other disciples. What, what were those commitments? What do you teach us? What will have us, Lord, in our day standing apart? Because we believe this. We know this. A healthy church will stand apart. Father, make it so of this church. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that. You may be seated. So here's, here's something to think about. Uh, have you ever had just really, really good news that was so good that you couldn't wait to share it with somebody? Like, I mean, I mean, you would immediately just get on your phone and get on social media to share that news or find somebody you could share that news with. Stacy, you'll remember this. When, when we first discovered that she was pregnant with our first daughter, and it was getting to the time where we could begin to share the word. It came right up on, I think it was my sister's wedding. Was it my sister's or my brother? I think it was my sister's wedding. And so we had all the family together, and we were just like bubbling over, man. We're like, all right. Because some of the family were going to be grandparents for the first time. So this was a big deal. This was big news. But time out. We didn't want to hijack my sister's wedding day. I mean, what do you, what do, you do? I mean, that would have... That would have just interrupted, interfered. It would have stolen her thunder. That was her weekend. And yet all the family was together, and we were just like, ah, I don't want to say something. Don't say. So we're all together for the rehearsal dinner, and it's like, she having a baby. But we didn't say anything. I just couldn't. I, I was excited. And then we had the big day, the ceremony, and even through the reception, it's like, oh, when do we, uh, I want to share this news. This is good news. It's really good news. And, and, and I remember, it's like at, as, the, as the car was driving away and they were going for honeymoon time and 
we might have even followed them to play a prank where they were having their honeymoon time because word got out as to where the, the honeymoon place, at least the launching place, was going to be. I think it was, wasn't it up in the, the art district in downtown Chattanooga? So we secretly followed over so that we could, like, decorate the car and do some funny things to play pranks. But my dad was there. And when all, I mean, the wedding was over, we could move forward, life moves on, I just remember going over to him and saying, you're about to be a grandfather. Remember that? And it just blew the roof off. I mean, it was so cool to be able, and finally we could share that news with our family and celebrate that Allie Grace was coming along. And Avery, sorry, it wasn't quite as exciting the second time around. That's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true at all. I just felt like picking on my youngest daughter. You know, that's what happens when you're the baby in the family. But think about that kind of news that you just bubble over that you can't wait to share. And, and let me say it this way. We share this in common with every Bible-believing evangelical church. That's the message of the gospel we share. The life, death, resurrection of Jesus. The greatest news in the world that God is real and he has created you. He's given you life. And through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you can have a relationship with the God who created you that you are forgiven, that there is hope. And that is a, that's a great message, the best news in the world for you and for everyone in the world because there's only one way to the Father through the one who laid down his life for you. The best news in the world. We share that in common. So think about how that brings us into unity with other churches in the sense of what we share. One God, one faith, one spirit, one message of hope, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. We share that, by the way, we share that in common with the church that was meeting in Philippi. They had that same message of hope. And by the way, they were doing a lot of the things that we would be doing. Ministries, preaching that shared the gospel. But don't you find it interesting that Paul would say, of all the churches in the Roman Empire, you only uniquely, totally uniquely stand apart in this thing. And that's what we see in verses 14 and 15. If you'll go back to your Bible, he says this, you shared in my trouble. Paul's ministries were hard. He had people attacking him, putting up walls of opposition and challenge. He says, you shared in that to help me. And that was risky for them because some of that same Jewish persecution could have come down on them. But he says, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of all this, when I left out of Macedonia, no church, even some of the ones he helped to start, no other church entered into partnership. That's a word of investment and involvement and commitment. That they say, Paul, we are in step with you in giving and receiving to advance the gospel. Paul says, only you. Accept only you. And so it's interesting that there were other churches, and maybe they were doing good things, but this was unique, and it stood them apart. If other people had come along and said, you know what, we're looking for a church that is fully invested in the advancement of the gospel through church planting, being disciples who make other disciples and taking the gospel here and beyond here. We want a church that's on fire for the mission. This church could have said, come, come be with us because this makes us unique and how Paul is our guy and we are all in with him. We're even raising up young ministers to go be with him, to advance and create and plant other churches to advance the kingdom of God. This church was all in. And by that, they stood apart. And it's not that they would have bragged about it, but they could have said, hey, if you're looking to be real about the gospel, you'll find that here. It stood them apart. Now, in the business world, we would call that what you see on the screen, obvious distinguishing value. You stand apart. Why would someone want to come be part of that? Because there's nothing else like it. It's unique. It stands apart. Obvious, distinguishing value. Businesses have it. Why can't churches? And it's not that we're in competition, but a healthy church will stand apart. They will. And, and that's important. Let me say a couple of things. I counted on my way into this campus from my house to this campus this morning. I passed by seven church campuses before I landed here. And I would ask the question, why in the world would someone go out of their way to come to this place? There are other churches. 
We all have the same mission. I mean, some are more faithful than others, I hope, I guess. But the life, death, resurrection, we share a lot in common. But why would someone come here? And that's why I say a healthy church can answer this question. What are the values that will distinguish us as a healthy church? A healthy church will stand apart. And sadly, we shouldn't. But I'm just here to tell you that a lot of churches aren't healthy. They're just not committed. They're just not focused. They're just not faithful. We have an opportunity as we think about these pathways of being more like Jesus and compelling a culture that drives people to be more like Jesus, we will stand apart. And as we focus just a few minutes on what this church was doing, what they were about, here's an opportunity for us to discover the value that will have us being different in a good way, a salty way, different for the kingdom. And it's like people be like, ooh, if I'm serious about the mission, I want to be there because those people get it. Those are movers. Those people are serious. Those people are authentic. Can I just say this, that people that are looking for church, and there's so many who aren't, I get that. That's a hard boundary to overcome. But for those who are, you know what they're looking for more than anything is genuineness and authenticity and to be and to do what you say you are. And so many churches are just pretending. So if we stop pretending and we say we're going to be about these commitments, a healthy church will stand apart. Beginning with commitment number one. Here's commitment number one. A church that's committed to loving people. Should churches be loving? Absolutely. Are all churches loving? You tell me. You tell me. A commitment to genuine, authentic love that moves the needle. Look how it moved the needle here with the church in Philippi. Because Paul goes on in verse 16. He says, even in Thessalonica, when, I was, when he was suffering persecution from the Jews, and they came after him, for this church in Philippi to continue to support him and be in partnership made it risky for them. And yet they did not stop. He says over and again, you continue helping me and supporting my mission. But he says this, not that it was about the gift. He says, I, I wasn't seeking the gift, but he says, I'm seeking that fruit behind the gift. As you grow to be more like Jesus, there's something that's motivating you to partner with me in the gospel ministry. What was that, what was that motivation? It was love. Because here's, here's the cool thing. If you go back to Acts 16, when Paul was there, boots on the ground in Philippi, what did the jailer do when he came to faith? He invited Paul and his team into his home with love and hospitality. What did Lydia, the business lady, do when she came to faith? They were part of that early church in Philippi. What did she do? She invited Paul and his team into her home and begged them to stay with love and hospitality and they genuinely loved Paul and so even as he went out they continued that love as they grew to be more like Jesus the love of Jesus abounded through them to support Paul even when it was tough even when it was hard even when it was risky and for Paul to say you alone is interesting to say all these other churches weren't doing that why I don't know. Maybe they supported other ministries. Maybe they just lost the focus. Maybe they weren't being faithful. Maybe they had become selfish. Maybe whatever. Paul, we want to support here, but we're not interested in anything beyond our own selves. Some churches get that way. How do we invest in a commitment of love? To be, and sadly, churches ought to love. But if we're committed to love the way we see this Philippian church loving, loving when it's hard, loving when it's risky, loving when it costs you something, that's the kind of love that invites people. That's the kind of love that reaches out to people who are different from us. Not with judgment, but with love to lead them, to begin a relationship with them. It's a kind of love that's not cliquish. It's not insider. Here's the truth. A lot of churches love each other so much that they're like these little holy clubs and huddles. And a new person can walk in this door and be ignored. And maybe you've been there where you visit a church campus and it's like you were never there. Does that happen here? If I ever hear that it does, it burdens me like a stake to the gut. You come to me, we'll fix that problem. I promise you. That brings out the Uncle Jason when I hear those kinds of stories. 
All right? I want to knock somebody on their keister in Jesus' name when I hear those kinds of stories. I can't love and welcome everybody, but that's my heart. A, a, a church that will stand apart is a church that will love unconditionally, love sacrificially, inviting people, welcoming people, and, not, and saving seats for people. You don't have an assigned seat in here. And if somebody comes in and sits in it, that's when the love dries up. Hey, you're in my seat. And suddenly there's no more love. But a church that loves gets over that and says, sacrificially, whatever it takes, we will love. It's interesting. Jesus says this in John 13, 35. The world will know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. The world should be able to know that we're different and unique by the way we love. But sadly, every church should embrace that message. I'm telling you that a church that genuinely, authentically loves will stand apart, even from other churches. Because there are some churches that just are not loving. They might love themselves. That's the problem. They love themselves too much. We will stand apart, and a healthy church will stand apart if we are committed. Think about this in your personal time this week. I want you to think about the love that you've experienced that hopefully comes from God, that overflows into your life through your relationship here, the love that you've experienced, and I hope that you have, think about it and say to yourself, how can I pay that forward? That it's not just anymore about me receiving love, but I want to share that very love that I experience here in this church. Because a healthy church will stand apart in the commitment it has to loving. Even the people that are sometimes hard to love. Loving. Here's number two. Healthy church will stand apart we need to be committed to this, to leading. Love's one thing. It begins a relationship, and it drives it. It compels it. It motivates it. But what are we doing with it? Are we satisfied just when people show up, and it's kumbaya? No. Which, well, we shouldn't be <laughs> leading people. Look what he says. This is so, it's so interesting what he says in verse 19. He says, listen, um, I've received. And then he says, my God will now supply everything of yours that you need. Paul had received, and he says, now you're going to receive, verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches, his resourcefulness, his measures, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I read that this week, and I thought that's interesting. These people were generous because of love. And they bound together to help Paul in his ministry, motivated by love. They were supplying Paul's needs, but Paul says, turn that around. It's actually God who is supplying. God is the source. And so he says, as you're helping me, God's going to be helping you. And this all flows because it all comes from God. So you don't have to worry about the in and the out. Just keep your focus on God and being faithful. And God's going to be the one to supply. No, I asked the question. They had generous people who were tithing, who were giving. Lydia, some of those others, I'm sure, were pouring in with generosity, and it flowed outwardly to help people like Paul to advance the ministry of the gospel. But let me ask you this. Do you think that that church in Philippi had a finance team? Maybe. I don't know. Do you think they had a budget, like, like what we're going to confirm at the end of the hour? And I'm not saying those things are bad. But do you, how do you think, do you think they sat around and talked about money? It's so interesting. Answer this for me. Look in your New Testament. Where do you see information about church budgets and finances and a focus on money? 2 Corinthians 9, they, they talk about being generous. And by the grace of God, we need to be generous. God is generous with us. We need to be helping other churches, helping other people, yes. But there's so little information about church budgets and church finances. And you know the reason? Because God says don't focus on those things. If you will focus on the main thing of being committed to the mission of God, God will supply your every need. So in other words, we need to have budgets. We need to have good stewardship. We need accountability. We need encouragement. But don't let that be the focus. Focus on leading people. Focus on being disciples who are making disciples. And when you're white hot and committed, here's my promise to you, as we see in Scripture right there in verse 19, God will supply your every need. God will supply. 
You know the churches that are drying up and dying and struggling? They're the ones that get so selfish because they're worried over money. They don't have any. They're not faithful. There's nothing flowing. And then they get focused on that little myopic of what are we going to do to keep the doors open? They're not thinking about what are we going to do to advance the kingdom of God? And the more selfish they get and the more myopic they get, the more they move away. And I would ask this question. Do you expect God to bless a selfish church? Do you? I don't. Do you expect God to bless a selfish church? So we got to stop that. Focus on the main things. Keep the main thing the main thing. And, and we got to fight for it. That I'm committed to being a disciple who will make other disciples, and I leave the other stuff up to God. Even in Matthew, the Great Commission, Matthew uh, 28, 19 through 20, Jesus says, go and create church budgets. No, he does not. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you. You need something, God with you. You need something, verse 19, my God will supply your every need. And, and I love this. It's not on the screen, but, but Paul back in chapter 1 says, I am confident that God's going to bring you to completion, that God is going to continue to advance your mission. Why? Because Paul knew how invested they were and committed they were to loving people and leading people. That's it. They were committed. And so how does a healthy church do that? It's a church that says we're no longer satisfied with high attendance, that we want a culture that drives people to get smaller in relationships with other believers, that moves the needle towards spiritual healthiness, that gets us in the Word, that gets us down to even one-on-one -on -one discipleship, mentorships, internships. We want to be about helping you be more like Jesus in a culture that drives the mission forward. And if you're not growing spiritually here, you need to wonder why. And you need to complain. We have a complaint department, right? Send me an email, right? Call Email church office, one word, at fbcfo.org. Go to our website, fbcfo.org. Go under connect and send us a big fat, what are you doing? Because I'm not growing. Now, it's a two-way street. Don't sit back on your couch or whatever and be casual about your relationship and blame me for that. Don't blame me for that. It is a two-way street. But a healthy church will stand apart because it's committed, no matter what, to being disciples who are making disciples. This church here in Philippi was committed to the mission, and Paul could step back and say, God's going to move you forward. My God's going to supply every need because of your faithfulness. If you focus on what God cares about, God's going to care about you, and he's going to supply your needs. That's not health and wealth. That is a promise that God loves this church, and he will drive, and he will provide everything that we need if we are faithful to the mission of God. It's a promise. We just read it in Scripture. My God will supply. Think about this. Think about this, how you've been led, how you are being led in this church, and hopefully that you are, and you will say this. I want to pay it forward. As this church has helped me to grow in my relationship with Jesus, I want to help somebody else. I want to be a disciple who's making other disciples. And how we teach, how we get smaller and even smaller, in the Word of God, advancing that and trusting God to supply what we need to make that mission happen. A healthy church will stand apart when it's committed to loving and leading. But finally this, this is our final point today. When a, when a church is healthy, it's going to be launching. Now, time out for a moment. When I was preparing this message, I needed an L word because you've got loving and leading. What are you going to come up with? launching. But I got to thinking, don't let that misinterpret, don't misinterpret that. I don't mean kicking people out. I don't mean like, get out, launching, like out, the ejection button. You're not part of the mission, eject, out, launching. I don't mean that kind of launching, because that wouldn't be very loving. <laughs> some, but some people will not care about that mission, and they will go find a church somewhere else. That's fine. Let God take care of that. But think about this. I'm talking about a church that is discipling so well that it is raising up and sending out. Raising up and sending out. Look how Paul ends the message today, the text, and he ends it with a prayer. He says, listen, verse 20, to our God and Father be glory, not just now, 
but moving forward forever and ever. And he invites us to say, I agree with that. Amen is a word from Hebrew that says, I'm all in. Amen. I agree. I see what that church is doing. I see how they stand apart, and I am all in for that. Not that we're competing, not that we're bragging, but a healthy church will stand apart in the way that it loves, in the way that it leads, and in a way that it launches. Now, this church was invested in the gospel to such a degree that it would carry forward into the future. Paul even says that, to God's glory forever and ever, not just now, not just momentarily, but moving forward. What did he mean by that? Well, for one thing, this is kind of obvious. Their support helped Paul write the New Testament that we're now reading. Talk about moving the needle forward. In 2022, we are reading part of the fruit of that church helping Paul as he wrote the very words of Scripture. Did they know they were making an investment in that kind of future ministry? Probably not. But they left the results up to God. We're all in on what Paul's doing. Paul writes Scripture, and here's this church in First Baptist in Fordo over 2,000 years later that's going to be bearing and experiencing the fruit of what that church invested in all that many years ago. I think that's pretty cool. I don't know about you. I don't always want to know, and, but you never know. They had also, don't miss this, had raised up a young minister named Epaphroditus and sent him out to help Paul, to minister to Paul. He actually became a minister to Paul. When Paul wrote this letter, Paul was in prison. Epaphroditus became Paul's hands and feet to be a courier, to be a minister, to carry the gifts back and forth, to, to help. To the, he was a chain of supply, keeping the ministry moving forward even when Paul was stuck in prison. And so it's interesting that this church had a vision of forward thinking, that we're investing in the next generation to raise them up, to be ministers long after we are gone. That until Jesus comes back, the ministry must continue. And Epaphroditus was part of that future. A healthy church will stand apart in the way that it raises up and is willing to send out for the future and the advancement of the gospel ministry. Was that unique back in their day as churches were just getting started and they're raising up ministries, they're raising up ministers? They didn't have seminaries. But every member, a minister meant that sometimes God would take those people and launch them. You know, we, we talk about this in the United States. We talk about the American dream a lot, especially during election years. And you'll hear it said like, you can go and be educated and advance yourself. Go and be lifted up. Go be re We want to send our kids to college, and yeah, we do, to raise them up, to be and grow and have careers and send them out to advance in their careers. But why, why don't we think about the way we raise up and send out ministers? And, and I'm not saying everybody just goes to seminary and becomes a professional minister. But I'm talking about people who will become moms and dads who have that perspective to be the ministers that God wants them to be. So if, if a university is going to raise up, why can't churches raise up? That we come alongside to say, listen, we want to invest in kids and students. We want to invest in the next generation. We want to invest in the future Epaphroditus kind of people who get it and want to carry this forward to God's glory forever and ever, amen, that it moves forward. This church was so invested that Paul says, you stand apart in the way that you have partnered with me, invested with me, and this ministry will carry forward long after we are gone. Now, were other churches doing that back then? I believe so, because they didn't have seminaries and churches were being planted. Where do those pastors come from? But in our day and age, tell me where you've been part of a church that was really raising up future ministers. Some to go to seminary, whatever. Some of them to be church planners, to be pastors, to be ministers. But some to just raise families and be ministers right where God sends them to be. That they may have jobs out in the world, secular jobs, but they are the ministers that God wants them to be because the church has raised them up to send them out. What would it take for our church to be that kind of equipping center where you come and you put your big toe in this water, 
We're going to move you down the stream to where God wants you to be in spiritual growth, becoming that minister. Does that mean God's going to send you out? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know, but I leave the results up to God. But a healthy church will be launching. What do you expect is going to happen if we don't? Are there going to be future ministers? Are things just going to die off? I mean, what, do, what do we do? So in other words, what are we doing to be intentional in how we teach, how we expect? If you don't expect it, the culture will not change. But if you're expecting every person a minister, every member a minister, and we're driving towards that, and we're paying it forward, and how we love, how we lead, how we are prepared to launch, God, I see the potential, and I'm so invested in it that I can't wait to see. And you may send someone to a university. That's great. But as you're raising them up academically, we want to grab hold and raise people up spiritually to be the ministers. We need mentorships for that. We need internships for that. We need our Sunday school classes to drive it. We need our small groups and life groups to drive it. And if we don't expect it, the the culture will never change. It won't. But a healthy church will stand apart because of its commitment to loving, leading that way with intentionality and sending out by saying, God, you're going to take this potential and you're going to launch it. You're going to launch it. You're going to launch it. And that's what's going to happen. And I don't know all the potential, but God does. And when I was thinking about that, this is how we'll close. (laughs) I would love to talk to the dude who led Billy Graham to Christ. Now, here's the story. 1937, I think, he was 16 years old, and he was at a revival meeting. It was the last night, and he heard this verse, Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us anyway. That's how he demonstrates his love for us. And Billy heard that voice. He heard that message. And at the end of the service, he, begins, he, he began to come down front, not really sure what to do, what he was doing, what it really meant. But when he got down front, here's what he said, here's what he said in his story, his testimony is that other people were down front, and they were, some of them were emotional, maybe tears of brokenness, tears of joy, whatever. And Billy was like, I wasn't feeling all that emotional. So maybe I just need to go back to my seat. I'm just up here for the wrong, whatever. And so I kid you not, he, he was turning around to go back to his seat. And a member of his family, distant family, came and intervened and led him back to that altar, prayed with him, led him to the Lord, and began investing in him. See, Billy Billy didn't have a church. He wasn't connected anywhere. He hadn't grown up hearing the gospel. He he was there for the wrong reasons, by the way. He was there because he had been told there was going to be controversy and drama because of some of the things being preached there that was different from the culture, and he thought, oh, this is going to be fun to watch. I want to see controversy. And instead, he heard the gospel. The greatest message in the world. And he was so close to just going back to his seat. I'd love to talk to that dude that said, no, Billy, let's walk this forward. That guy invested in him, poured into him, led him, discipled him. Not knowing, not knowing what would come of that. And that's the cool thing. When we're committed to loving and leading, you you don't know what God's going to do. What if we miss those opportunities? With our kids and students these days, are we fully invested in that ministry? You don't know what God's going to do. And it just begins with our commitment to see the potential and say, man, we're going to be on that pathway, and yes, we will stand apart. There won't be any church like that. Because most churches have just lost that saltiness for the gospel. They're just not doing it. They're not loving the way they should. They're not leading the way they should. And they're certainly not raising up the future generation. That can be us. That can be you if you're committed. For those of us who are worshiping online, listen, bless you. Table Talk's coming. Stay tuned for that on our, all of our social media pathways, highways. 
uh, table talk and our discussion guide so that you can take this a little deeper and lots of time to reflect on what we're talking about today. Bless you in this. We are cheering for you. Have a great week. We're going to say goodbye to our friends online for now. But for those of us here in this room, this is what we're going to meditate.